All right, everybody, welcome to our first Career Pathways event for the fall 2019 semester. Thank you all for coming, and please know that this event is being recorded, so feel free to also, if you know you wanted to come back and check it out, or if you think that uh, you find this workshop to be amazingly useful and you'd like to recommend more of your colleagues um, learn about the information, please feel free um, to share that link with your colleagues as well. Um, my name is Lee Youssef. I am chair of the Career Pathways Steering Committee, and what that means is I get to run this amazing program. Um, this is one of the few events, uh, a few events that we run uh, in the fall semester, and we'll be running a few more in the spring. I do want to kind of make you aware of some of the additional events that we're hosting. So we will be having an event in later October on developing effective writing assignment. So those of you who anticipate being in the classroom or being a faculty member assigning writing assignments to your students, um, this workshop will be designed to really help you work through the intricacies of developing writing assignments that are relevant and resonate with students so that you get the work product that you want rather than what you hope to, to get. We will also be hosting some workshops on e-portfolios. And um, that is really targeted at those of you who are interested in this, preparing future faculty, preparing future professional certificate, um, as the e-portfolio will be the uh, mechanism for you to track the work that you do in uh, trying to receive the preparing future faculty, preparing future professional certificate. Uh, we do have drinks, we have snacks, and we have handouts in the back of the room if you um, would like some handouts. So um, we will have Karen Vaughn. On start and Karen, are you okay with kind of questions yeah. in the middle? Yeah. So if you have any questions, please let Karen know, and um, I will be monitoring the WebEx event from the back of the room. So if you have questions from the online audience, I will let you know. Okay. All right. Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Vaughn. I am the head of scholarly communication and publishing at the University Libraries here. And that's a brand new title. I was the digital initiatives librarian, so that's what my card still says. I still have a lot of those cards, so gotta wait and get rid of get rid of some more of them. Um, so it's difficult to do copyright workshops because you just don't know what people already know. So I'm probably gonna go a little fast through some of the basics. So stop me if you need something to be clarified. Um, I have a lot of slides and I have a lot of stuff to cover, so that's another reason I'll probably talk a little quickly. Anyway, so, um, well, first off, I also want to say that I am just providing information. I am not a copyright lawyer. I am nowhere near a lawyer. Um, I can gather information and I can give you guidance, but I can't give you legal advice. So um, if you have specific questions that aren't answered in here, please feel free to contact me. And I may need to contact our university counsel, Jay Wright, who is the lawyer person. Um, so hopefully we won't have to go that far because a lot, a lot of copyright questions, they, you can probably figure them out on your own. Um, and then the other person I wanna mention is Khaled Abdul Hassan. He's in the Office of Research, the head of patents. I forget his exact name. But a lot of times when you're doing your graduate work, your material is possibly, you know, you could poss possibly have an invention from it. You could possibly patent it, trademark it. So that office is available for those kind of questions. And it's a good idea if you have things that, that you're thinking could go to that end, um, it's a good idea to get in touch with them now. So I just want to mention those two things. So I'm going to get through some of the basics. I want to let you know what copyrighted content you can use in your work without getting permission, and then on the flip side, when you would need to get permission. Um, also, um, a little bit about what you can use in your teaching. So if you're a graduate teaching assistant, or if you're going to be faculty, um, what kinds of things you can use. I might spend a little bit less time on that. How do you seek permissions? And then your rights as an author, and that includes your thesis or dissertation and any other publication. So I'm hoping I'm going to cover all of that stuff. Um, so basics. The definition, I guess, it's a limited form of protection for authors of original works of authorships. There should be some kind of creativity in that as well and that are fixed in a tangible form. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. It's limited. There's, it, it's protected. Original works and they have to be fixed. 
And the whole purpose of it was to promote the progress of science and the industrial arts, and the useful arts, sorry. This was, went back to the beginning of the Constitution in 1790. They had this as, a, um, as the purpose of intellectual property. So copyright is just one of those aspects of intellectual property. Trademarks and patents are another. Question. Um, and how do you, you know, how can you promote progress by, by providing copyright? It encourages authors to go ahead and do work and do their research and come up with things, create new things. Um, and it, knowing that it's protected, you're more likely to, to do that. So that's how that gets encouraged. Um, and then the other thing is, um, what is the other thing? I forget. Oh, yeah. Um, Talking about authors, that includes creators. So copyright is for creative works and as well as scholarly works, as well as all kinds of stuff. So um, the exclusive rights of a copyright owner. So you are going to be a copyright owner of your dissertation or thesis. So you will have these exclusive rights that are given to all authors. To reproduce it, you can make copies of it in any medium. You can create derivative works, and that's especially important for um, if you want to um, publish your dissertation or parts of it as a book or as an article or several articles, you have the right to do that. That's one of your exclusive rights. Um, if you're a creative um, person, you would have the right to, if you're writing a short story as your thesis, you can have that performed. You can sell it to Hollywood. You can, you know, do whatever you want with it. Um, distribution, you can, as I said, you could sell it, you can rent it, you can lend it, um, you can distribute however you, however you want. And then public performance, generally for creative works. If you wanted to perform your 300-page dissertation in a public forum, um, you can do that. I doubt you'd have many listeners after the first, you know, 10 pages, but anyway. And you can grant permission to others for others to use as you want them to use it. Um, and this includes all or, or even just parts of a work. So some of the things to note are that exclusive rights are limited. That was one of those things in there. And so generally, it's the author's life plus 70 years from the author's death. So that's, that's a long time. Um, but it can also be renewed. So if you died and somebody, you left your estate and that included your research, your scholarship, um, they could renew that copyright after those 70 years. But it doesn't happen that often that copyright gets renewed. It can also be transferred. And we're going to be talking about that when we talk about publishing your work because you would normally, people transfer all of their copyright to a publisher in order to publish it, and we don't want you to do that. You don't have to do that, but that's one way that you're going to transfer your copyright. And then there's a lot of exceptions to the exclusive rights, and, and the main one for you is fair use. Yes? Karen, just, um, so when you do that for a publisher and transfer the rights to them so they can publish your work, do you retain any rights as the author? Depends what you signed. Um, the, and all the, the agreements are different. And I'll talk a little bit about that, and I have a sample of one. Because I never read them. I just saw them. Yeah, that's what, that's what happens. In fact, on November 21st, I'm doing a workshop on author rights, um, how to keep your author rights um, in the library. I think it's probably at noon, November 21st. It's a Thursday. Um, so if you all wanted to attend that, that's, that's fine, too. Um, yeah. The other thing to note is that copyright is automatic. You won't see that little copyright sign on many places anymore. Before 1989, you had to have that. After 1989, you don't have to have you know, the little symbol. You can. You know, if you feel like you just really want to stress that this is your copyright, you can use that symbol. And there's actually a formula you use. You put the symbol, your name, all rights reserved, or something like that. Um, and then people have to go to you to um, ask for permission. And you're not, you're not required to register your copyright, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about your dissertation and thesis, because when you submit that to um, ProQuest, um, one of the options you have is to have it registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. They give you that option. What does it mean to be fixed in a tangible medium? I mean, you just have written it on your computer, is that... That's a tangible medium. It's there. You can prove that if, as long as you keep your computer. Um, yeah, but so printing it out, whatever, that, that's tangible. And that comes to our next slide. 
as far as um, fixed in a tangible medium. Ideas, your ideas, if they're just, you're talking, that's not fixed. Um, another thing, a choreographic work is an example here. The actual choreography, that's not fixed unless somebody records it. So then it becomes who owns the copyright, the person that recorded it or the person that was dancing. Um, titles, names, short phrases, and slogans. Those are not copyrightable, but they are tra trademarkable. So you could have a trademark. So just because that title's out there, and you say, oh, I'm going to use that you know, in my whatever. Um, it's possible that it's trademarks. So you have to pay attention to that, too. Um, listings of ingredients, I like this one. If, if I just say, you know, a cup of sugar, a cup of pepper, a cup of this, that's not copyrightable. It's just a list of ingredients. But if I have the recipe there and tell you what to do with those ingredients, that's what's copyrightable. Um, so like the phone book, it's not copyrighted, but, you know, because it's facts. It's factual. Okay. And also like things, um, statistics. Um, temperatures, things like that, those, those would be considered facts and those are not copyrightable by themselves. So if somebody published um, a chart that had census statistics in it, the census statistics are not copyrightable, but the person's chart or how they used those statistics would be, they would own the copyright to that. So if you publish a paper and you generate your own statistics that are not said to what you did in yeah. your chart, is that... That's your, your, that's your, your, that's your copyright. copyright. Yeah, you own that. So is my PowerPoint covered by copyright? Yes. Yes, it's fixed. Um, you can see it. Um, and it's my own work. I used a lot of other work in it and I... I credited the other people that I used, but it is it is my work and it's fixed. Um, so will your thesis or dissertation be covered by copyright? Yeah. Um, and how about your class notes? Drafts of papers for, for class. Yeah, it's fixed. It's your work. So. Um, how about a photo that you, you post on Facebook of yourself or of anyone else, but you took the photo. Is that covered? Yeah. Yeah, and I actually had a question from a graduate student about that because she wanted to use something from Facebook in her dissertation. Um, and Facebook's terms and conditions, and I'll talk about that, about you know where to find those kind of things. Um, they say that you own the copyright for whatever you post, but they also have the right to use it in any way they want. So that picture that you posted, they can go post it, make money from it, and, um, you know, for their advertising or whatever they want to do. So you still own it. And so if somebody wanted to use it other than Facebook, they would have to get your permission. So um, a lot of this is to let you know that, that authors have rights and you want to respect those rights because you're going to be authors too. You want other people to respect your rights. So, um, so when you're using works, and you will, I'm sure, in your um, graduate work and in your um, professional work, um, you don't have to seek permission if the material can't be copyrighted. So all those things, the ideas and the stuff that we just covered, um, you don't have to get permission to use that. Um, if you merely want to link to it, you don't have to get permission to link. Um, but these three other things, if the material is in the public domain, you don't have to get permission to use it, and we'll talk about what the public domain is in a minute. Um, and if it has a license of some type, if the terms and conditions say it's okay for you to use this, you can use it without permission. And Creative Commons licensing, we'll talk about that. Um, and if, you, if your use can be considered to be a fair use. And I have a, um, a handout that's a fair use checklist. It's two-sided that you can use to determine the, if it's a fair use of the material. But the other thing I want to stress is that you always have to cite everything. You can't just use it and not. So you always acknowledge who the creator was of the work that you're using. Yeah. So I do a lot of work with government authors. Uh -huh. So we have this whole thing about work for high, or corporate yeah. authors, work for hire versus... I honestly have never really been quite clear on... I mean, it sounds like the university technically doesn't pay me to publish 
publish. So right. when I do a paper, it's not really a work for hire. No. But I know some of the government employees, you know, they're paid to do this publication. And then I had to always have this issue of, it just ends up being really confusing about can it be copyright? I'm, I'm always clear about that. No, right. works created by the federal government are not, they're in the public domain. Okay, so if you have government authors, like from NIH or something, uh -huh. um, how... If they did that, is if, you know, uh, yeah, how do you know? How, um, yeah. But if they're doing I'm that as... I it and publish it, but I... Right. We, we, at ODU, our, the intellectual property statement is you own whatever you do, students, faculty, what you do. The, you, the, we don't have to go to the university to get copyright permission to use something that you did. So you own it and you're in charge of it. But in federal government, um, people that work in the federal government that are publishing things under the auspices of that department or whatever, they, that's open. That's public domain. You still have to cite it, but it's public domain. You don't have to get permission. So, because I think the way we get around it is we publish a report, which is the government document, and then we publish the paper, which quite honestly seems an awful lot like the report. Yeah. But it's the report which they supposedly did on their own time. Right. Which then makes it copyrightable. But yes. then sometimes some government employees don't know that you're not supposed to check work for because if you check work for hire when you submit it, then you have this whole problem it's not yours right yeah so but it just seems kind of um really semantics sometimes yeah you know, I, I can see what you're saying the other thing is if you got a grant from the nih right is that a government work no that's your work they're giving you money but there may be terms in the the grant that that you have to do certain things with it or that right. you can't do certain things with it but usually when the federal government um grants you money to to, to do research, they want it to be open. So right. they're going to want you to make this open access to the world because they're paying for the research and people need to get to the research. So, um, yeah, so it's if it's a government, you know, published by a government office, then that is public domain. Yeah. I have a question. So um, talk about the works that are either no longer protected by copyright or never were. So um, is, does that still fall within the 70 years after the author's passing, or is that different? Yeah, if they're no longer protected by copyright. And I'm pretty sure the, the general rule is anything that was published prior to 1923, it's public domain. So if you're doing historical work, that's good. <laughs> but if you're doing real current work, it's you know not as good for you. Um, the other is... Um, uh, works from 23 to 63, and I haven't worked out the math, so I'm not sure, but uh, whose copyright registrations were not renewed. So anything before 1963 that didn't get renewed. Um, and then the other thing is that whole thing about the copyright symbol since March 1989. If it's a, a work that was published before 1989 that doesn't have that symbol, then that's in the public domain now. Because that was the requirement. If you wanted your work to be copyrighted, you had to use that symbol. So there's all these, you know, iffy things. Um, how this all works. So can I stop you on that? Um, what about it specifically speaks to the United States? What about publications from across the world? That's a good question, and I don't follow copyright, international copyright. This is kind of new to me. So I, um, yeah, there is a lot of stuff out there. So if you had questions about that, um, that I, I do need to learn a little bit more about the international. I also wanted to ask, uh, I was thinking, what exactly can we consider um, the public domain? You know, for example, are we able to get someone's age or someone's, you know, professional status on the internet. You know, some people have it on their Facebook. Are we able to get it? The question came up and someone was saying she hacks the person about um, a age or some other information. The she age? Said, Someone's no. age? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, it was available on Facebook. So yeah. the question is, can she go in and get it from Facebook? But the person was not willing to give at that time. So Yeah, that's, um, you'd have to look into that because that's, that deals with privacy more mm -hmm. than copyright. So, I mean, if you wanted to use something, 
that was going to defame somebody because, like, oh, look that, how old that person is. They said they were this age, but look at how they look. Or whatever, you know. So you have to think about the privacy of the person, too. But the reason I say you have to look into it, and I should look into it, is that anything you post on social media, you're posting it out there for the public. So it should be, it should be usable. I don't know if a study like that, you have to have IRB approval. So they might consider it exempt, but oh. you have to. I yeah. Know, I don't know if you need that. That's what, yeah, I think Jim's right. That's more of a research issue than it is a copyright yeah. or protected intellectual yeah. property type question. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, another thing that people say is think about how you would, you know, use the golden rule. Think about how you would feel if someone you know, publish them, you know, so that's always, uh, I guess that's the moral, the moral part of copyright, but it's not, no legality in that. You can't sue someone for being immoral. Maybe. I, I would just say, <laughs> with regard to the Institutional Review Board and the human subjects protections, if you're doing research on human subjects, you, I know a person who had a violation that went to the Federal Office of Human Subjects Protection, they could bar you from doing any research with federal dollars for the rest of your career. Wow. So you don't want to have that violation. So you make sure you, if you're handling data on a human, you know, and it's protected, you need to go through that process at the university. Otherwise, yeah. you can find yourself in a whole heap of trouble. Yeah. But I should write that down because there's a lot of things that I've been thinking about that I really need to get some answers to. And the social media thing, that's kind of a, you know, a new thing about what are the legalities about social media. So, Yeah. I'll have an addendum. I mean, they might consider something like that exempt, but you yeah. have to go through yeah. and just make sure you get that determination. Yeah. And someone had asked me about posting a, a conversation that was on Facebook, and it had, you know, the people's... And I said, just as a matter, I think you're okay to do that, but you really need to delete the names for privacy. Um, okay. So anything else about public domain? Okay. So that's the other thing is just because something's on the internet, it doesn't mean it's in the public domain, just because it's way out there with the public. Um, and then there, here are some resources, and I'm giving you this so you'll be able to click on these. I um, wanted to spend more time and have a more, uh, like a handout to give you on all the different resources that there are. There's tons of resources out there. So there's this copyright genie. You just put in your, like, what's the date of the publication you want to use or creation of the thing and, and how, yeah, how do you want to use it. Yeah, I forgot to tell everybody. I will also be posting this PowerPoint presentation on the current faculty website. So I forgot to, to make that okay. earlier. So. Okay. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of different things that you can use to figure out, is it in the public domain? All right. So the other thing that you can do is check the terms of use and licensing. You may not have to ask permission if they're clearly telling you what the, per what the permission is. So I have found in like articles and stuff, terms of use, it could be called terms and conditions, use policies. Um, they might have an explicit statement saying this may be used for educational purposes. So they're giving you permission to use it for that. But if you, so you use something in your thesis or dissertation because it says, you know, it's educational. Um, if you want to publish that as a book or as an article later, you're going to have to get permission to use the item. And a lot of times people, if it's for profit that you want to use it, or if you could potentially get profit from it, um, they're going to want you to pay them for it. So there's, there's a cost in there for, you know, for using people's things. So you can do the same, but you shouldn't because it's, you know, it's for the common good. All right. So Creative Commons licensing, this is the most wonderful thing that has happened. And I don't know why I have a little is there. Oh, I get, okay. Anyway, um, this allows you to determine what use you want to be made of your work. So, um, and you can allow it to be free. You can allow it, you, you can allow people to remix it. You can allow people to share it with other people in any way. So there's a lot of different a aspects of this, but it's a nonprofit organization and it's also a movement to try to get rights out there for people to use and not to have to seek the permission. Because sometimes it's hard to figure out, you know, the permissions. So these are the conditions of the license, and they look like this. I'm sure you've seen those things. I don't know if you noticed on the beginning of my PowerPoint, I had one of these licenses on there. Um, so the person means you have to attribute the work to that person. You have to cite the source. 
Share alike means that if you're going to do anything with this, if you're going to remix it, if you're going to use it for some other project you have, you have to assign the same license that the person that you took the stuff from assigned. Um, Non-commercial means you can't use it for commercial benefit. And no derivatives means you can't mix it, you can't edit it, you can only use it as it is. So there's six different configurations of those four items, and this is, the, this is the standard one, and it's the most accommodating. They're just saying, you can do whatever you want with it, but you have to give me credit. Um, this is the most restrictive. They're saying, you have to give me credit, you can't use it for commercial purposes, and you can't edit or do anything with it. So that one is the most um, restrictive. So I want to ask you, if I assigned this one to my uh, PowerPoint, what could you do with it without asking me? Anybody? You could make a derivative of it. Um, correct. So it I doesn't take say. Slide the, and actually put it in a another presentation. Yeah. You have to give credit. You have to give me credit. Can't use it to make money. So, and what do you have to do if you use my slide? I have to let somebody else. You have to give them the same licensing. They can share it. And, I mean, they can um, edit it as well. So, um, yes. So, like, what if I use like a piece of music for performance that's under this license? That's a that that's a, it's a performance where there's a ticket cost to it. I mean, it, it goes to. Mm -hmm. Serving, you know, that, that money doesn't go to me necessarily. Right. It goes to the organization to help run its costs. Is that commercial? Yeah, that's still commercial. So in that case, what I would do is contact the person and say, I want to use this. It's people are going to pay, but it's not. It's benefiting my thing, okay. and th then they can give you further permission. You know, one argument we've had in our department among faculty and our administrators has been if we work at the university in our course materials, does the university own our course materials? In other words, can they, because I've seen faculty who have left and other people take their course materials and present their course with the same exact materials from the faculty member who left. And, you know, we seem to have this recurring, I, no, none of us know the answer, that's why we keep arguing about it. Well, plus also a faculty, so we like to argue. But, um, but like, I'm just wondering, like, is, based on what you're saying, unless the person puts this Creative Commons license, it sounds like to me that's not actually legitimate um, without the person's permission. Like, they leave and go somewhere else. Or, but did they, it seems like they would have had to, I mean, if they left it with the department, that... Well, it's the problem we have is once you put it on Blackboard, our department oh. has access to all of our Blackboard sites, oh. and... They go into Blackboard and can just take your stuff off of the old Blackboard mm -hmm. stuff without you even knowing it. And it just sounds like to me that's a violation unless you do this Creative Commons. It sounds like to me that's yeah. really not something they they should be doing. It's a good question. I have to write that down. I Wait, would you write that down for me? That because, <laughs> because it's a really significant yeah. Because, you know, And the problem for us is you know, we have some okay. faculty who, who take a course from another faculty, they're using their materials, which based on this doesn't seem quite right, but then you also have this issue where the, the faculty member might not have the same level of competency in the person who left, so that they're using materials that really were... Well, see, what, what, what my initial thought is, it is their property, but they can choose to leave it here. But see, that's if they don't know, but shouldn't they know? Yeah. But I think the other part, I think particularly for the doctoral students in the room, this is also the other part where you actually are like saying, you have to read what, what you sign. Because, for example, with online course development, part of the contract specifically says this is work for hire. If you're getting for the course. An online course okay. development here at ODU, it is considered work for okay. hire. So you don't own it, right? You can take that same expertise and that same course to a different institution because it's still technically your individual property, but because it's work for hire, it also right. stays okay. with the university. Okay. So I think those are the nuances that part of, that we would like you to come out of this workshop recognizing is, you know, sometimes you are rushed for time and, and the journal says, sign here <laughs> to transfer copyright, and you say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, but, you, you know, 
And, and, and as faculty, we're not always as good about doing that too. Because sometimes I'll tell my coworker, oh, "I'll be able to sign for me. You can, you can, you can sign on my behalf. I haven't even looked at the document." Right? <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. so that is part of of why we're doing this workshop. Is it's important to know your rights and know how to respect other people's other people's work. Right. Uh, personally, if you I take out a loan, you have you read the fine print. Right. If you you know if you're doing stuff with money, you're going to make sure you're. Doing that, so do there's that with your the, property. Too. There's also the point of new, new uh, professors, students that are teaching their first courses, etc., and they they do share their powerpoints right. as one of them maybe taught it two years ago and mm -hmm. has built the powerpoint. They share it, but they they don't stipulate. You know, this is copyrighted. I'm sharing it to you, so you don't have to think about how you create it. But I don't want. You know, but don't necessarily re use my material directly, but they don't say that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, do you have anything that you can kind of help me with this course development with? Sure, take a look at my stuff. And that's right. all it's yeah. said, but then there's no specificity. Right. So it could be, right. you know, it, mm. that's why these licenses are so great. Well, we've, we've even gone so far as to <clears throat> a faculty member who left, people weren't happy that they left. Where there were some rumblings from the administrative people that, oh yeah, well you know what, we own your material, so you cannot use this material at your new institution, mm -hmm. which seems really, aside from being petty, yeah. 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 those kind of issues. But there was a real question for the faculty member who left. who said, wait a minute, did I sign something that yeah. said you own my material and I don't own it? Yeah. Which is really, you know, um, problematic. Yeah. I gotta look that one up. But but the other thing, Karen, I would just say, and we just based on your comment, this is one of the reasons why some of our faculty members in our department don't like to use the um, CLT. Mm -hmm. The CLT pays you to develop a course, but you're signing oh, a work for hire. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do it yourself, they're, the, the, you know, my argument is always been the university is paying you to teach, you're not paying me to develop my course. So I own my material and you don't because you're just paying me to teach. No, I mean, nobody's ever paid me to develop a course. Um, <laughs> right? They just pay you to show up and start teaching. Right. right? But obviously, you have, to, you have to teach. But the subtle difference is, if you didn't pay me to develop that material, I did that on my own time. Therefore, I own it and the university doesn't own it. But with CLT, there's an explicit agreement that you have to sign that says they're going to pay you $4,500 to develop this course. But then the problem is now it's a work for hire. Yeah. Now they really do own it. Yeah. Because they also show up to teach, and here's the material. You right. Teach. right, right, right. You know, it's all yeah. put together yeah. for you. Right, yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. That would be no. the best person yeah. yeah. ever. <laughs> right. That doesn't happen. Okay. But it's a legitimate issue for the reasons yes. that we had a faculty member who left. Yeah. Where there were some people who were in a petty kind of mood and kind of annoyed and irritated at each other. And there was some talk about, well, you, fine, you can go to another university, but you can't use any of your stuff. Mm. Which is, which of course is not. I think the faculty member went to a legal person and said that's BS. But still, it's just the aggravation of somebody actually making that claim. Well, but theoretically, if they use that exact course at another university, that would be a violation if it was a work for hire here. If it was a work for hire, right? yeah. So that's why you have, yeah, yeah right. So what if the name did something different? What if what? What if it was named different? <laughs> named if it's still the same. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> People can go, you know, it's a Blackboard course, who's going to see it, you know, so there's all that, but, yeah, legally, you know. Okay, so fair use, and this is a big deal because this, we're in an educational institution, but just because it's for education doesn't mean it's a fair use. I have to get that cleared up. So um, it allows um, you to use copyrighted works with, without the permission, um, but it's limited portions, limited use, and limited purposes. And this is... Um, one of the things from where did I get that from? I didn't. I didn't cite that. See, I haven't totally finished this thing. Um, with copyright uh, office circulars, they've got so much information. Um, so, for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, um, it's not an infringement. Um, and that this that, this um, yeah. fair use checklist is a good way to. Um, to decide, and you would want to keep this because if someone came at if a copyright owner came at you and said, "I saw this published on the internet, and this was my work," um, the fair use checklist will will help if you got if it got to a court of law or something. It would help so that they would understand how you came up with this as a fair use. 
So um, it's not going to keep you from getting sued if you take your course and move it to another. I don't know if this would be a good example, but anyway, but it can help in helping you determine if you're okay using it without getting permission. Um, but the thing, also the thing that I think is, you know, if you're ever in doubt, just ask for permission. And if it's an educational use, if it's your dissertation, most likely people will say, yes, go ahead and use it. If you want to publish it later, I want to, you know, I want you to pay me for it or whatever. So, um, so the first, okay, the first factor is um, character of nature and character, of the purpose and character of the use. So if it's nonprofit educational, if it's for teaching, Anyway, you can read it. So there's all those reasons that it weighs in favor of using it for fair use. If you're publishing it, if it's gonna be for public distribution, um, that would weigh less. So if you checked all the marks on the ways in favor of fair use, that would, that would be a good thing. That, you know, if you were in a court of law. Oh, it's on the back of the rest of it. Um, if it's, so if it's fact-based, if it's nonfiction, if it's important to your objectives, that would weigh in, in favor of fair use. If it's a highly creative work, that's one thing where it doesn't weigh as heavily toward, toward fair use because you're using somebody's creative work. They might be able to make money from that or you know, recognition or whatever. Um, the amount of the work is also, if you're using a small portion a page, two pages out of an entire, you know, hundred page book, that's more fair use. If you, you can never use the whole book. Um, but so it just depends on how small the amount is that you're using. Um, anyway, oh, the effect on the market is a big deal. So if you're trying to make a copy of chapters of a textbook for your students to use so they don't have to buy it, that affects the market of that. And that would not be a fair use. Um, there are, there are reasons that you can, there are other ways that you can go about it. You can put the textbook on reserve so all the students can get to it. You can um, purchase, if it's not a textbook, but um, you know, like if you're teaching a literature class, you can put a novel, um, you can purchase it from the library and make it so that all the students have access to it. It's multi-users, multi-user license. Anyway, um, so this is something good to hang on to and use it if you're trying to determine if your use is fair in the educational so setting. So I have a question yes. in regards to that. So just, I'm keeping one, for example, here in, in factor one, researcher scholarship. If you're using it for researcher scholarship, okay, but does that trump something in the terms and conditions? Yeah, no. If the terms and conditions say you cannot use state. this at okay. all, then you can't. Because that's what I'm trying to figure out in, in these different things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if there's if there's nothing spoken, then that would that okay. would take precedent. Yeah. And the idea is that they they want this fair use um, option because um, you want you know you want progress to continue in research and stuff. And so if you're restricting a student from using, uh, you know, something, a quotation out of a novel or something, then um, things are not going to progress. And so if they're using it for commentary, for critique, for um, learning, then it's, it's going to be okay. So that's kind of why the fair use thing came about. And I know, um, I know a writer, he's a freelance writer, and he hates fair use because he feels like if anyone uses his stuff, he wants to get paid for it. Um, but, you know, fair use exists, and he's you know, got to deal with it. But it's also, it's not ever going to be the whole thing. It's going to be a small portion. Um, okay. So does that kind of, let me see what else I have here. Oh, just some resources. Um, Again, it's the Columbia University Libraries. That's a nice explanation. Goes through all the different factors and stuff. The Fair Use Evaluator is one of those that you plug in your answers, and it comes up and says, "You're it's a fair use." Um, and I found that I, I used to have a lot more of those kind of their um, sort of flash based. Those. So I can't. My computer is Chrome. It doesn't use flash anymore. So I kind of got rid of. A lot of those fancy ones that needed flash. All right, so let's ask some questions. 
So if I found a Google in Google Images, do I need permission to use it? No, it's just your class. <sighs> okay. Um, we haven't gotten to the instruction part yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but true, if it's for your in-person class and you're just going to show it. Right. Um, Sometimes Google Images have the Creative Commons. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, so this, it depends. And, and mostly the answers to these kind of questions are it depends. So you want to look and see if it has a Creative Commons license. Um, you want to see if... You know, you click on it and it might have the terms there or it might say strictly prohibited, you know, contact the <laughs> copyright holder, whatever. Sometimes I see the ones that have the author's name and um, they published a whole lot. Yeah, so copyright. Is that okay to use then if it has that um, information? No, yeah. that would, I would say they're giving you their information so you can copyright, to contact them to, to ask permission. Yeah, so that the Google Images, it's fun to find things there. But I want to tell you, though, and if I had time, I would do it. But um, when you go to Google Images, there's a thing that says um, terms, I think, on the on, underneath. Like, you can pick colors. You can pick all kinds of things. So there's terms, and it says copyright terms. And you can pick one that says available for um, – I should have printed it out at least – for um, reuse. Available for reuse with modification. Available for reuse non-commercial. So it has those things, and you click on that, and it'll narrow your images down to things that you can that you can have permission to use under certain circumstances. So that's a good thing. Google Images has a lot of those kind of things. You can you can pick icons. You can pick all kinds of things. Okay, tables, figures, images from other publications. So Dr. Blando published a paper, and he has a really nice table in there that gives results of his research, and they're perfect for what you are trying to do in your dissertation. Do you have permission to use that? <laughs> no, you would have to seek permission for that from him, because that's his work, that's his data, that's his... Yes? Well, um, once you get permission, after that, when he accepts, then you can cite. Right. Yes, and then if you're for any of the things you do, you want to get that in writing, and I'll mention that later. You want to get it in writing, because if he came back and he, you know, and he's, you know, 89 years old now, he's like, "What? She used this?" <laughs> and he forgets that he told you. Right. Um, you would have to have to show that in writing, and in your thesis or dissertation, there's um, an addend appendix, I guess, that where you have to list yes. list those things. So always get it in writing. Yeah. A standardized form and you go to make those requests or is it you just go directly to the author and you go directly to the author and you can actually also email um, we and where I work we I run the repository the institutional repository and so we have to go to publishers all the time to see if we have permission to um, include our authors publications in the repository um, so we just email them they send us back an email we keep it um, but there, when we get to that point, there's a lot of um, sample permissions letters that you can use. I think it's uh, Columbia or Connecticut that has some really nice, nicely worded letters. And a lot of organizations like the United Nations do have forms okay. that you have to fill out and submit. So it's we don't read it through the school or through the university whatsoever? No, it's you. It's, you know. <laughs> Maybe another one for sorry, class presentations. Maybe you just want to show your colleagues why presenting in class. I mean, yeah, you're okay. That's in it, that's within classroom. So, sorry, that's a fair use. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So if it's a class presentation and it's you know it's just in class. so kind of where does that limitation come in from classroom to um, your field of studies annual conference? you know, national or international conference to then publication. I mean, where does that top out? It, it really, it, it, it's inside a classroom, in a closed space, and anywhere else you have to, you probably have to get permission. If you're presenting something at a conference and you have up on the screen with all these, it's public, dis, public performance almost, um, that would not be legitimate. You would have had to have gotten permission to do that. Um, and, but I suppose if you're at a conference and you're in one room and you show it on your PowerPoint and it's not going anywhere else, 
and if you that would be a fair use it, if you put the credit yeah the slide. yeah I would say that would be a fair use but if you're publishing that paper and you have that in, you sure would yeah that. yeah okay um, and the other thing though too another it depends um, look at the figure look at what they say um, if you're taking something from the World Health Organization and you go to their terms and conditions, it might say you can use any of the data, any of the tables, anything in here, as long as it's for educational use. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you wanna note that, and you know, so that you can list that in your dissertation. So having an article, say you published an article in a journal and you wanna use that in your dissertation. Not myself. Pardon? <laughs> Ask yourself, yeah. <laughs> No, the main thing about that is that if you have a published article, you have to see what terms were with that because you may not have permission to use your own article in another format. So if you signed over your whole copyright, the publisher owns your, owns your article. And you would have to get... Pardon? Read the fine print. Read the fine print, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have an example... Um, I interviewed this guy from the Virginia Symphony Orchestra, and he was talking about George Bush came and to Norfolk, and he conducted the orchestra for something. So they took a picture of him, and then uh, Associated Press wanted it, so they sold it to Associated Press, and then they wanted to use it in a commemorative um, book that they were publishing, and they had to go to Associated Press and buy the photo back from them so they could wow. use it. <laughs> yeah. Some, uh, some author agreements I've signed they'll have a term in there where you can have up to 50 copies to distribute uh, oh, wow. to colleagues and what, they'll give you like uh, some number that uh -huh. if anybody counts them. But, um, but the one question we've always had is some faculty members like to put their publications on their own website. Yeah. But then is that, I don't, it, yeah. that, that seems like that's not. It's not, and a lot of people do it. Yeah, a lot of people do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but technically, no, you're not supposed to. If they, unless it says, we're giving you 50 copies, you can post them online, you can do anything right, you want right, with them. Right. Then you can do it. But if they say, we're giving you 50 copies to distribute to your friends, they're talking about, you know, personal. personal they can see, maybe you send the PDF, your friend can read it, but right. they can't post it somewhere else for everybody to get it free. I didn't know anyone did 50 copies. I've heard, like, you know, five copies or something. I've had a journal... Yeah. Do 50 copies, oh, but wow. they track the downloads. Oh, okay. So after 50, you'll get okay. downloads. Yeah. Yeah. So that's tricky. And luckily, the woman that came to me with that question, and she had signed away her copyright, um, there was a stipulation on that publisher's website that said, if you are going to use this in a thesis or dissertation, you have permission. Mm -hmm. So she was able to do it. But um, it's also said if it's for, you know, if you want to republish it somewhere, you have to come to us and pay money. All right. So now I'm to instructional uses. And what time is it? All right. Um, yeah, just, I, just so. one comment I want to make about the previous slide. You know, the pressure that we have to publish. Yes. I, quite frankly, could not imagine as a faculty member making a beef with any publisher. If they were going to publish my article and I know it was going to go to print, I can't imagine saying to a publisher, you know what, before we do that, you need to da da Do you have tenure? I, well, I do, yeah. Yeah, so, so now I, you could do it, right? I still probably wouldn't really feel comfortable doing that. Well, um, it's happening. Every, everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and publishers are accepting it. Really? And I've heard that, yeah, there's publishers that give you the, the standard form and you say, I'm not comfortable signing away all my rights. I want to reserve it so I can use it in my classes, so I can possibly reuse the information right. in there for another publication. They'll say, oh, okay, well, then we'll give you this. Agreement. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Hmm, I didn't know that. So, I mean, so it's happening more and more, and there's this whole um, Spark, which is scholarly publishing. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that one. But um, they have an addendum machine. You can put in all the information, who oh, it's really? going to, yeah. and they generate an addendum for you. Addendum, addendum mm -hmm. for you. Okay, so instructional. This is going to have to go fast. We talked about, so all those things, um, everything the above, what applies to copyright, but also the fact that face-to-face -face is very different from distance, from online education. Um, you have to ask the same questions. Is it copyrighted? Is it in the public domain? Is it li open license? Does the library have a license? That really comes in when you're talking about 
using things for instruction because we purchase all kinds of things. And one of the things we're doing is we're purchasing them for educational purposes so our faculty and students can use them. Um, and so a lot of times there is a license that you can reuse it. Um, that'll have its own terms and agreements. But um, so for example, if you wanna show your class a video, um, we have certain video collections that will allow you to do, to do public performance and show it in your class and show it in an online class. So keep that in mind. If there's something you wanna use and it happens to be in the library, check with us and we can tell you if you have the permissions to use that for teaching. Um, and then again, is it fair use? So in class is a lot easier. You can make a photocopy for each one of the students you, um, well, one thing, it's never okay to make copies of exercises tests from workbooks. You're never supposed to do that. And you can't copy an entire book. Um, as far as video or audio, make sure it's a legal copy. That's another thing that if you get something from YouTube to show to your class and it's an illegal copy, then I don't know how they're going to know that you did it. But anyway, um, well, I guess maybe if you're showing it from YouTube and someone is investigating that video and they see that you used it. I don't know. So <laughs> if, we, if we're using a video from YouTube, so I had this, where I'm using a video from YouTube, but because I know someday that link may disappear, I really want to yeah. copy, I use the free YouTube downloader, uh -huh. and I download it as an MP4 file. The file, I have some videos that are no longer exist on YouTube, but I have the MP4 file because years ago I knew, oh, I might want to use this. That's fair use because I'm just using it in my class. Yeah. But I also make it available on Blackboard so the students can download the MP4 file if they want it. Mm -hmm. Is that still? No. Um... Right. Well, see, and, and I'm a really bad um, copyright person because I feel like, you know, in some cases I could see a reason for being able to do it. If there's nowhere else in the world you can get that and it's really important to your. Right. pedagogy that your students see this full video um, and there's no other way to do it because you can't link them to the YouTube right. video um, anyway but that's me and I'm not a lawyer so okay. you know. your non-lawyer opinion would be I shouldn't post those mp4 files yeah okay. unless you get permission unless you could, if you can find the yeah, original I didn't know how we'd find permission yeah. Yeah, okay. even right. though it's yeah. behind uh, yeah a yeah yeah See, and that's why, yeah, it doesn't make any sense because, and a lot of faculty, they feel like they should be able to post an article that they download from the library's website, post it to, to Blackboard for all the students to be able to read, but technically, the license for a lot of these articles says you can use a portion of it, you can't use the whole thing, mm -hmm. and so the answer to that is easy, though, you link to it. If you want all your students to watch a, a film on um, your distant students, put a link to it. Yeah, but see, in that case, if and and that could be a case of fair use, mm -hmm. showing showing that uh, putting the um, copy on Blackboard so people could watch. So it. that could be that could be. Fair, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to shorten them. No, I know. Long, so. Yeah. Right, well, you can use a portion of it. Yeah. I love right. your honesty because most people do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Most people do it. Right. But yeah. I mean, if you, you if you're doing that as a better fair use, yes. Yeah. So that would be okay. And they even will allow you to like. I remember in the library we used to do a lot of video for faculty where they wanted us to take portions of different DVDs and put it onto one so they could just show that in their class or right. online. Um, you know, instead of taking in and out the um, the DVDs, and that was allowable because it was still just that portion. Interesting. So a link to a YouTube video is okay. A link, yes. And you can embed a YouTube video in a PowerPoint or in Blackboard too. You can embed it because that's not, you're not like taking it. It's still going to YouTube to um, to watch it. I can, sh can I show a YouTube video on, in the classroom? In Like here, I could yeah. show you a YouTube video right now because we're in the in face to face classroom. I'm going to write that. Um, I got lots of stuff to ask Jay Wright. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go on. Teach Act. This is the thing that made it so that online classes could have some of the same benefits of in-person classes. Um, digitizing analog or print works. 
Yeah, so that is where if you um, if you wanted to post something on Blackboard that was only in print, you could digitize it. Um, but again, limited portions and defined conditions. We ha it has to be a university setting. It has to be, I mean, there's a lot of different um, rules about the Teach Act and what it says you can do with um, online instruction. But I have to hurry because it's already almost one. So online instructions, limited portions, not full work. Um, link to library copies rather than posting a copy. And we've always wanted faculty to do this. Um, it's so much easier to take the PDF and upload it. So, you know, I'm not the police and I don't, you know, if that, but technically you should be linking. And you always have to have the, there's a proxy um, server that we have. You have to have that code in front of it or your students won't be able to get it. And putting the proxy code in there says you're an ODU person. You know, you have to put in your ODU information and then you can watch it. Um, and then for books, I was mentioning you can put them on reserve. You can, you can have the library purchase an electronic copy that can have multiple licenses. Not all books have, well, have that, have e-books available, have the option to be an e-book. Um, again, link to the library, Canopy, uh, academic video. There's a lot of video streaming services that we subscribe to that will allow you to show them in a Blackboard class or... Um, embed it to a legitimate YouTube copy um, and show a reasonable portion. All right, so here's some questions. Can you download copyright protected images and place them in Blackboard? It's a D word, depends. <laughs> if you, uh, you know, you have to ask all those things. Is it, is it, um, does it offer permissions? Does it have licensing? Does it have whatever? Um, but technically, you should get permission if it's something that says you need permission to <laughs> contact the, the creator or whatever. Um, can you scan your own copy of a short story? You paid for it, so can you scan that and put it in Blackboard for your students to read? Technically, <laughs> technically no. Just because you bought it, that gives you the right to read it. It doesn't give you the right to distribute it. So what you're doing is you're distributing their work. Um, can you download a PDF? We just covered that from the library's database and place them on Blackboard. You have to look at the license, but a lot of the journals, they say no. So it's better to link. Can you show a full length video in a classroom? We kind of got that. Yes, you can. Okay. There is a, a guide that I did a long, long time ago, like almost 20 years ago, Copyright and Copy Wrong. There's an FAQ that, that addresses a lot of the specific things um, about... Let me just read you a couple of them. Um, well, how do I know if the work is, is in copyright? Um, if I violate the copyright, am I liable or is the university liable? You're liable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, limitations on posting material within Blackboard. Can I borrow a book from the library? scan it? No. Anyway, and then there's a lot of stuff on video. Can I convert a VHS copy of a film to DVD? And that was a big deal for a while because a lot of places, we don't have DVD players in classrooms anymore. So if you wanted to show, a, a, I mean, VHS, if you wanted to show a VHS, you couldn't. So yes, you can have it converted to DVD unless you can buy the DVD, then the library can buy that for you, the DVD. But if there's no other way, it's only on VHS, you could make a, you could convert it. Okay. Okay. Um, See, and I haven't even gotten to, oh, and then in a televised classroom, can you show a full-length video? No. Okay. Um, and there's resources for that. All right, so when to seek permission. Anytime you're in doubt, seek permission, unless you obviously know it's not. So find out who owns the copyright, and that can be hard. Um, you ask permission in writing, and you save it. So that's really important. Um, if you can't find the owner, you can go to the online catalog of copyrighted materials at the office. Copyright Office keeps since 1978. So if you decided to um, copyright your thesis or dissertation, it's going to be listed in the Copyright Office list of, of copyrighted works. Um, and then also, if you're not sure, you can, you can use the Copyright Clearance Center to see if you can, what the permissions are for using that. Um, and sometimes you have to pay for that, but 
I'm not sure how much because I didn't get a chance to look into it. But this is what the library uses when we get questions for interlibrary loan from people. Like we want to borrow something, we go through the copyright clearance to make sure we that the copyright's available, that it's okay for us to do it. Silence is not permission. So if you contacted the author and they're not getting back to you, you say, well, I guess I can use it. No, you can't. <laughs> Try again to contact them. Um, Plan ahead because sometimes, it, for, especially for your thesis or dissertation, it sometimes takes a while for people to respond to you and for you to get the permissions. And then always keeping in writing. So it's not enough just to provide a citation. You have to get permission. All right. Um, University of Connecticut, they've got all these sample letters and explaining when permission is needed. Okay. As an author, um, you own the copyright to your dissertation. You're going to upload it to ProQuest. Um, and you sign an agreement, and what that agreement says is you still have all your rights, we're just going to publish it in, in ProQuest. When you go for the Digital Commons copy, that's the university's copy, um, you sign an agreement that says we don't own it, you still own it, but we're, you know, we have the rights to put it up. So you still have all your exclusive rights. Should you register copyright? This is a big question for um, graduate students because you don't have to. It's not necessary. Once you have that fixed in a medium, um, it's, it's copyrighted. You don't need the symbol, you don't need to register it. But if you think that your work is going to be a high value project and um, it's possible that someone could steal your work, if you have it registered, then you have the right to uh, file a lawsuit or whatever. So you, you can legally go after the person. If you don't, all you can do is say, could you please stop doing that? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so if you think there could be a legal dispute or somebody says, I wrote this and now this person just published their dissertation on it, but the legal dispute, they would find out when that was copyrighted and it was before that was copyrighted. Anyway, um, another thing that happens is essay mills are out there and they um, steal things off the internet that are open. And when you publish in Digital Commons, it's open to everyone. ProQuest requires a subscription so people can still get it. But with Digital Commons, it's open for anyone. So um, if you wanted to um, do register for copyright, it costs $35 if you go straight to the copyright office. It costs $55 if you use ProQuest. When you submit, you just say, yeah, go ahead and register it. Or don't. Most people don't, I would say. Um, a lot of the creative writers, they do. They do register the copyright. Um, it's $55 for ProQuest, but if you can afford that extra $20, they just do it for you. So, um, Embargo. Should you, you have the option to embargo your thesis or dissertation? And um, right now we have it, so you pick six months, one year, or two years. If you want a longer embargo on it, you can do that. Um, it's still going to be available in Digital Commons, so the abstract will be there. So it will show, yes, this person did do their master's or dissertation at, at ODU, but it, you won't be able to download it. And it'll, if you have a, a date, it'll say available, you know, February 2nd, 2020, or, I mean, 21 or whatever. Anyway, so you can do that. And some of the reasons are creative work. That's, that's a big thing. Um, creative writing people, they don't want their stuff out there for people to steal. Um, if you have plans to publish it in a book and you already know the publisher is going to um, consider this a prior publication, um, that would be a reason to do it. Most publishers don't see dissertations that way, though. They see them as um, you're going to revise it if it's going to go into a book form. Um, and then patent, if you are, if there's an invention possible or something, you definitely want to, um, to embargo it. And so embargoing it keeps it uh, the actual item away from the public. It's not in ProQuest. It's not in Digital Commons um, for whatever pe time period you specify. Um, and we did have somebody, the, copy, the patent office called me to say, this person got their degree two years ago and their um, dissertation is in Digital Commons and ProQuest. And we want to um, use it as an invention. IBM wants it. And it had already had 560 downloads, so they didn't take it because someone else probably. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so if that person you know knew, so that's why you got to think about what you're writing. I mean, if you're, you know, if it's if you're in engineering or you're, you know, those people I think do a lot of invention type things. Um, anyway, so you can consider embargoing it. 
most most what we like though in the library world in the world of open education is you've done the research it needs to be used it needs to be discovered so it's good to be open access it's good to have it out there for other people to use everyone doesn't steal um there's probably few cases of that but um you know you've done this this is your work why not you know share it and let other people benefit from it and especially in global areas where they have no access to subscription databases and stuff like that. So that's my spiel for the good of humanity. All right. Author rights for other. Okay. So again, read carefully. So when you're publishing something with a publisher, read it. Um, I brought one recently. A faculty asked me, is this, um, what should I do? Should, is this a good, um, Publishing agreement, okay, grant of rights. Contributor exclusively grants, the contributor is the writer, exclusively grants, assigns, and transfers to publisher all right, title, and interest in and to the entry throughout the world in all languages and in any format or media of any and all kinds, whether now known or hereafter invented, in whole or in part, alone or in combination with other works, and including but not limited to all copyrights in the entry for the full term of copyright and any and all extensions and renewals thereof. Wow. The only thing that you asked for was different forms. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it needs, I said, no, you're giving away your copyright. You're not going to be able to use this for classes. You're not going to be able to use this unless you get permission from the publisher. So, and then somebody else gave me one she was curious about, and it was so wonderful. It's from um, First Friday, and she had three options, and one of them, oh, let me see if I can get that real quick. Um, one of them is for her to dedicate the article to the public domain. This allows anyone to make use of the article at any time, including commercial use. A good way to do this is to use a Creative Commons license. The second one is retaining some rights while allowing some, while allowing some use. For example, authors may decide to disallow commercial use without permission. Authors may decide, anyway, use a Commercial Commons license. Or the third one was retain your full rights, including translation and reproduction rights, um, using the statement. They didn't ask for anything themselves. They don't need anything. Publishers don't need anything to, um, they don't need your copyright in order to publish something. So, okay, people are needing to leave. Um, so those are some of the rights, I don't know if you're looking, that rights that you might lose if you sign up to everything. Um, so you can retain some of your rights, you can edit the agreement, or you can submit an automatically generated um, author addendum through Spark. And I think, yeah, I have the, um, their information about author rights. Um, University of California has a whole thing about managing publishing agreements. And oh, we have a little, I did a copyright and author rights thing that gives you a little information. It's not like I'm saying that I'm in line with those people, but anyway. Um, all right, so attribution. I, again, I want to stress, you always have to cite what you're doing, whether you need permission or not. Just make sure you do that. And in... Online work, you don't not only want to cite, you want to link. Because I've had cases where I'm asked to see if all these um, sources are right of this student in a thesis, and I can't find them. You know, it's like he just didn't put enough information. And I'm like, if he just linked to the, it took me a while to be able to get to it. So you think of your users, if they want to go and use information that you cited, you want to, you know, let them get to it. You want to help them out to um, to get to it. So if you link to it, good citation and a link. But don't most citation formats, maybe not all of them, but don't most citation formats indicate that if you have taken it from the web, you have to provide that link in the footnote, in the bibliography? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure. Stuff. Well, yeah, this person didn't do that. But, um, but that's a general yeah, requirement. or if there's a DOI, that's in an APA yeah, it's style. It's in but, the citation. Yeah. I don't know. The link is usually required because they're just not doing it the proper way. Yeah, I think they're not doing it the proper way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And if they're linking straight to a table or something, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I'm not sure that the reference would end up doing that. But yeah, but that person definitely wasn't doing it right. Um, and so always sites so can find on both pages. And, um, and so then I have some of these other resources. This is a whole tutorial on copyright. This um, is what will be in ProQuest when you submit your thesis or dissertation, information about specifically about your thesis or dissertation. And then I have my own little attribution thing that I didn't quite finish, um, and who I used. 
I used a lot of information from um, UC, University of UC Berkeley, and their license was a um, CC BY, so that's what I made my thing because I used a lot of information from that. I think that's all. All right. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Thank you.